Are you preparing for your real estate exam? In this video, I'm going to give you clear and concise answers to 50 multiple choice questions so that you can ace your exam with confidence. We're going to move quickly, so hit the pause button if you need more time. Let's get going 50 exam questions in 30 minutes. Good luck. A broker may hold earnest money without depositing it in a trust account if the seller has given written permission, if the buyer has given written permission, with written authority to do so, under no circumstances. The answer is with written authority to do so. The broker would need the permission of both the seller and buyer to not deposit funds as required by state law. The terms for holding the funds should be spelled out in the sales contract. A leasing agent has received a security deposit for a lease. What is her next step? Deposit it as soon as practically possible. Deposit it immediately. Deposit it immediately in the operations account. Give it to the broker as soon as possible. The answer is to give it to the broker as soon as possible. The broker or property manager is responsible for depositing all funds in the trust account per the times required by state law. A leasing agent has given a security deposit check to the property manager broker. The broker should deposit the check in. The bank. Any designated interest bearing trust account. A security deposit trust account. Any designated account including operations. The answer is a security deposit trust account. The broker should immediately deposit a security deposit for a lease in a trust account. The trust account should have no other funds and should be designated as a security deposit trust account. The amount of time allowed will vary by state law. Commingling is the opposite of subordination, subrogation, separation, mixing, The answer is separation. Commingling means mixing or combining the broker's and client's funds. The opposite of commingling, therefore, is separation. All funds should be kept separate in the trust account, and proper record keeping is essential. Violations can have serious consequences. A salesperson has given her broker an earnest money check for an accepted contract. The broker should deposit it immediately. Turn it over to the seller immediately. Deposit it as soon as practically possible. Give it to the seller as soon as possible. The answer is to deposit it immediately. All trust funds must be deposited based on state law. However, a good rule of thumb is to deposit them immediately or as soon as possible within the state guidelines. The funds should be deposited in a trust account with no other funds, and as always with trust accounts and escrow accounts, perfect accounting of every dollar in and dollar out is required. Holding earnest money without depositing it is legal if done by a broker. Always illegal. Legal if done with written authority. Legal if done with oral permission of the parties. The answer is legal if done with written authority. Holding earnest money is legal if the broker has written authority from the buyer and seller to do so. Trust accounts hold. Buyers' funds only. Sellers' funds only. Funds for the firm, commissions, and other sellers. Funds not belonging to the firm. The answer is funds not belonging to the firm. Trust accounts hold funds that do not belong to the firm. These may include rent, security deposits, and earnest money. They may not include commissions earned or other brokerage firm funds. Under a property management agreement, who has the authority to return a security deposit to a tenant? A leasing agent or the broker? The broker only. Any designated licensee? Any licensee of the firm or the broker? The answer is the broker only. Only a broker can determine when and how a security deposit can be dispersed under the terms of the lease contract, 
and property management agreement. What must a broker do to make a dispersal from an escrow account when the seller and buyer do not agree on how the funds should be dispersed? Notify all parties at least 30 days in advance. Get all parties written permission to disperse the funds. Notify all parties in writing. Notify all parties by certified mail. The answer is to get all parties written permission to disperse the funds. Brokers may not disperse funds without the permission of the parties. Each state has laws that cover the steps a broker must take if there is an earnest money dispute. When a principal broker deposits earnest money received from a purchaser into a trust account, he is protecting himself from the charge of Novation Conversion Commingling Either commingling or conversion The answer is commingling. Commingling exists when operation funds are mixed with trust account funds. Conversion is using one person's money to pay another's expenses which occurs when the funds are in the same account or moved from the trust account. If a seller has already accepted one offer and another offer comes in, the listing agent should Submit the new offer Reject the new offer Hold the new offer Submit the new offer if better than the current contract The answer is to submit a new offer. The listing agent must promptly submit all written offers for real property to the seller up to closing. In this situation, the seller may want to accept a backup contract. All of the following are essential elements to a lawfully enforceable contract except Recordation Mutual assent Legality of object Consideration and competency The answer is recordation. To have a valid contract, four elements are needed. These are competent parties, mutual consent, legal consideration, and legal object so that the contract is legally enforceable in a court of law. No contract must be notarized, acknowledged, or recorded to be valid. An oral lease for two years is not enforceable due to the Usury Laws Statute of Frauds Uniform Commercial Code Statute of Limitations The answer is the statute of frauds. The statute of frauds requires all contracts for the sale of land or any interest in land, all listings of real property, and contracts exceeding one year to perform to be in writing. If such contracts are not in writing, they are unenforceable. Which of the following is the best real estate definition of contingency? Following rules and regulations. Obtaining a customer. Depending on something not certain. The basic principles of right action. The answer is depending on something not certain. A contingency is a provision in a contract that requires the completion of a certain act or the happening of a particular event before that contract is binding. In other words, the contract depends on something that is not certain to happen. An option in a contract by which the owner of property gives another person the right to purchase his or her property for a stated sum within a given period of time is a voluntary encumbrance. An involuntary encumbrance. A voluntary lien. None of these. The answer is a voluntary encumbrance. Because the option restricts the optioner to selling the property to only the optionee during the option period, it is an encumbrance on the title. Since it is entered into voluntarily, it is a voluntary encumbrance. Under the 1988 Fair Housing Amendments Act, the definition of protected handicapped or disabled individuals include all the following except those with HIV, IDS, the mentally disabled, an alcoholic with a history of violence, a drug addict in treatment.
The answer is an alcoholic with a history of violence. Alcoholics, those with HIV, IDS, and drug addicts in treatment are included in the definition of the handicapped who are protected under fair housing. Anyone, even if he or she belongs to a protected class, who poses a safety or health threat is excluded from protection. Which of the following citizens is not a protected class under federal fair housing law? Homosexuals. Men. Muslims. Syrians. The answer is homosexuals. Sexuality is not protected under federal law. Remember protected classes with fresh corn, familial status, race, equal, sex, handicap, disability, color, opportunity, religion, national origin. A buyer tells her agent that she has cash to purchase the property. The buyer's agent tells this to the listing agent when delivering the offer. The seller accepts the buyer's offer, over other offers, based on her having the cash to close quickly. When the buyer is asked to produce proof of having the cash to close, she cannot and tells the agent she does not have the cash. Who is responsible for the buyer's actions? The buyer. The broker. The buyer and the buyer's agent. The buyer and both agents. The answer is the buyer. The lie to all parties and is the party who is responsible for making a false offer. In this case, the seller would most likely keep the earnest money, since the buyer acted in bad faith. A buyer's agent who is calling to set up a showing on a listed property should disclose the fact that she represents the buyer so that the listing agent can avoid. A dual agency. Paying a commission. Disclosing material facts. Divulging confidential information. The answer is divulging confidential information. The listing agent should avoid sharing the seller's confidential information with anyone, but in particular, a buyer's agent. A licensee acting on behalf of a property owner is best described as a dual agent, a fiduciary, ratified, an implied agent. The answer is a fiduciary. An agent is a fiduciary. An agent must be loyal to his principal, fully disclose all material facts to his or her principal, account for all money to his or her principal, use skill, care, and diligence, and obey all lawful instructions of his or her principal. An agent is a dual agent if representing more than one principal in the transaction. An agent is an implied agent acting without express authorization, but assuming authority based on the principal's actions. A listing agreement between a real estate brokerage firm and a seller is known as what form of agency? General. Exclusive. Universal. Special. The answer is special. Special or specific agency, which a listing agent has, gives the agent no power to bind the principal. A general agent, such as a property manager, has limited power to bind the principal. Universal agency gives the agent, in fact, unlimited power to bind and act in place of the principal. In a single agency relationship, a real estate broker represents the buyer only. Only a buyer or seller, not both. Both buyer and seller. The seller only. The answer is only a buyer or seller, not both. Single agency means the agent represents only one party. The relationship between a real estate agent and his or her client is which of the following? Universal agency. A fiduciary relationship. A general agency. A dual agency relationship. The answer is a fiduciary relationship. An agent and principal have an agency relationship. An agency relationship is a fiduciary relationship. Agents must be loyal to their clients, fully disclose all material facts to their clients, account for all money to their clients, use skill, care, and diligence, and obey all lawful instructions of their clients. Universal agency is created by a power of attorney. General agency is most typically found in property management contracts. Dual agency is between an agent and two or more parties. 
the type of agency in which an agent has legal authority to act in place of the principal is known as general agency, special agency, specific agency, universal agency. The answer is universal agency. Universal agency gives the attorney in fact, unlimited power to bind and act in place of the principal. General agency has limited power to bind the principal, and special or specific agency has no power to bind the principal. The type of agency, which is typical in property management, in which the agent has limited authority to bind the principal is known as specific, special, general, universal. The answer is general. A general agent such as a property manager has limited power to bind the principal. Universal agency gives the agent in fact unlimited power to bind and act in place of the principal. Special or specific agency has no power to bind the principal. When a real estate agent represents more than one party in a transaction and this representation of more than one party is with knowledge and written consent of all parties, he could have his license revoked is his action is called dual agency, and he could have his license revoked. This is single agency and his general practices. His action is called a dual agency. The answer is his action is called a dual agency. Representing two principles in a transaction is a dual agency. This is legal if both principles are aware of it and give their consent. Single agency is representing only one party in the transaction. Which form of agency gives the agent the broadest powers to act for the principal? Special agency. General agency. All grant the same powers. Universal agency. The answer is universal agency. Universal agency allows the agent unlimited power to bind and act for the principal. Which of the following statements about brokerage operations is correct? The amount of a broker's commission for the sale of a home is limited by law. An exclusive agency listing permits the owner to sell without being liable for a commission. All agreements among brokers regarding division of commission must be approved by the real estate commissioner. A broker may never recover a commission if the contract was accepted after the listing expired. The answer is an exclusive agency listing permits the owner to sell without being liable for a commission. An exclusive agency listing provides that the broker is entitled to a commission if any agent sells the property. This allows the owner to sell the property himself and not be liable for a commission. The broker's commission is established by negotiation and not limited by law. Agreements between brokers or between brokers and salespersons may be oral. The broker can receive a commission if he procures the buyer during the listing period, and the seller accepts the offer, or negotiates the sale after the listing period expires according to the protection clause found in most listings. An appraiser needing to find the value of a single-family home would use which approach to value? Cost. Sales comparison. Income. Capitalization. The answer is sales comparison. The sales comparison approach is based on comparing sales prices paid for similar properties. This approach requires the gathering, recording, and comparing of sales data for comparable properties. A real estate professional is doing a CMA for a residential home. She would use all of the following data to determine value except Financing terms Location of the property Date of the sale Original cost The answer is the original cost. In the sale comparison approach, properties are compared based on their features, location, conditions of sale, and time of sale. Neither the cost of construction nor the original cost is relevant to determining value. A buyer is considering buying lot to build a single-family residence. She hires an appraiser to appraise the lot. Which approach to value would the appraiser choose to complete the task? Land residual approach. 
Sales comparison. Income approach. Reproduction cost. The answer is sales comparison. The most used approach to value vacant land is the sales comparison. The reproduction cost approach is used for buildings, not land. The income approach is used when the use of the property is one that will produce rents. The land residual approach is used to find the value of land when the improvements on the land are used to produce income. A post office of unique design and construction is best appraised by which of the following approaches? Sales comparison approach. Cost approach. Income approach. Gross rent multiplier approach. The answer is the cost approach. Special purpose and public service buildings and buildings of unique design and construction would be best appraised using the cost approach since there would be very few comparable sales for market data analysis, and there is usually no income produced by such properties. Reconciliation is best defined as the appraiser's determination of a property's highest and best use. An average of the value from each approach to value. The appraiser's weighing of each property and approach to value. The method used to determine a property's most appropriate capitalization rate. The answer is the appraiser's weighing of each property and approach to value. Reconciliation is the final step in the appraisal process, in which the appraiser weighs each approach to value and determines which is most relevant for the type of property being appraised. Averaging is never used in reconciliation. Replacement cost is best described as the cost of purchasing an equally desirable property, constructed of the same or similar materials. Cost of building a property of equivalent utility with the same or similar materials. Original cost adjusted for inflation. Cost of building an exact replica of the subject. The answer is the cost of building a property of equivalent utility with the same or similar materials. Replacement cost is the cost of a new building with the same functional utility. Reproduction cost is the cost of an exact replica of the existing structure. The period over which a property may be profitably utilized is known as Economic life. Profit. Income. Amortized life. The answer is economic life. The economic life is the estimated period over which an improved property may be profitably utilized so that it will produce a yield over and above the economic rent attributable to the land. At the end of the economic life, the building is usually torn down or rehabilitated. The economic life can never be greater than the physical life, but is usually less, as physical life refers to how long the structure can stand, and economic life refers to how long it is profitable to keep it standing. Compared to physical life, economic life is usually shorter or longer, depending on the type of improvement. The same. Longer. Shorter. The answer is shorter. The economic life is the estimated period over which an improved property may be profitably utilized so that it will produce a yield over and above the economic rent attributable to the land. At the end of the economic life, the building is usually torn down or rehabilitated. The economic life can never be greater than the physical life, but is usually less, as physical life refers to how long the structure can stand, and economic life refers to how long it is profitable to keep it standing. The income approach would be used for appraisals of Heavily mortgaged properties. Newly opened subdivisions. Commercial and investment properties rented to tenants. Heavily insured properties. The answer is commercial and investment properties rented to tenants. The income approach is based on defining the present worth of the future rights to income derived from the property. The income approach is used for income producing properties, such as apartment buildings, office space, warehouse space, shopping centers, retail store space, etc. An appraiser seeking to find market value would be concerned with all of the following except current market sales, income value, original cost of the property, 
Reproduction cost. The answer is the original cost of the property. The original cost of the property is not used in any approach to value. In an appraisal, the appraiser uses market sales, reproduction cost, and income value to determine market value. There are three main causes of depreciation. Which one of these finds its origin in social sources and is the basis for the old axiom, more houses are torn down than fall down? Functional obsolescence. Physical deterioration. Straight line depreciation. Economic obsolescence. The answer is economic obsolescence. Depreciation may occur from physical deterioration, functional obsolescence, or economic obsolescence. Economic obsolescence, being incurable, would cause buildings to be torn down before they fall down. Two comparables are identical tract-type homes in the same subdivision, built in the same year, and both sold on resale within 30 days of one another. The lots are of identical value. Comparable number one was equipped with a standard builder's model range and refrigerator, while comparable number two had deluxe appliances that cost $1,000 extra when the homes were new. The home with the deluxe appliances was sold for $500 more than the other. The subject property has the standard builder's model appliances. Which of the following is true? A $500 adjustment would be made to comparable number two. No adjustment would be made to comparable number one and a $500 adjustment would be made to comparable number two. No adjustment would be made to comparable number one. None of the above. No adjustment would be made to comparable number one, nor would a $500 adjustment be made to comparable number two. The answer is no adjustment would be made to comparable number one, and a $500 adjustment would be made to comparable number two. Adjustments are made only when the comparable differs from the subject property. Therefore, no adjustment is made to comparable number one. Since comparable number two has deluxe appliances, which the subject property does not, a $500 deduction would be made from comparable number two's sales price. Note, the cost of the item is not a factor, the value the item adds to the property is the factor to consider. Two appraisers were asked to appraise an apartment property. Both arrived at the same net income, but the first appraiser used a capitalization rate of 6%, while the second appraiser used a capitalization rate of 8%. In this case, the property with the higher cap rate will have a lower value, higher value, higher projected income, lower income. The answer is a lower value. The more an investor wants in return on a property, the less he or she can pay to buy it. Therefore, the higher the cap rate, the lower the value. If the property has NOI of $9,600, a 6% rate gives a value of $160,000, while an 8% rate gives a value of $120,000. The sales comparison approach to value would be best used for which of the following? Industrial property. Apartment property. School. The answer is single-family dwellings. The sales comparison approach is used when current sales of comparable properties can be found, which is most typical for residential property. An apartment building and industrial property would be valued using the income approach, and the cost approach would be used to value a school. To appraise a special use building, an appraiser would most likely use the capitalization approach, market data approach, cost approach, Comparison approach. The answer is the cost approach. Special purpose and public service buildings and buildings of unique design and construction would be best appraised using the cost approach since there would be very few comparable sales for market data analysis, and there is usually no income produced by such properties. Using the income approach to valuation, which of the following is not a proper deduction from effective gross income to determine net income? Interest payments on loans. Reserves for replacement. Maintenance expenses. 
management costs. The answer is interest payments on loans. Scheduled gross income, vacancy and bad debt equals effective gross income. Operating expenses equals net income. Interest payments on loans and income tax are not items charged against the property. They are personal expenses of the owner and will vary from one investor to another. Therefore, they are not calculated when determining property expenses. Reserve for replacements refers to money needed to be set aside each year to provide for the eventual replacement of short life items, such as carpeting and appliances. What formula would be used to estimate the value of a property using the income approach to appraising? Net income multiplied by the capitalization rate. Net operating income divided by the capitalization rate. Capitalization rate multiplied by gross income. The value of the land and improvements minus the depreciation. The answer is net operating income divided by the capitalization rate. The formula used in the income approach is net income plus capitalization rate equals value. For example, if the income is $15,000 and the capitalization rate is 10%, the value is $150,000. An appraiser was hired to prepare a feasibility study for adding a swimming pool to a 24-unit apartment building. What basic principle of appraising would be used? Regression. Contribution. Substitution. Competition. The answer is contribution. The principle of contribution values a component part of a property in proportion to its contribution to the value of the whole. Maximum values result when improvements produce the greatest net return. An appraisal is the market value, legal value, an opinion of value, a scientifically determined value. The answer is an opinion of value. An appraiser estimates market value. Since the market price is what buyers are willing to pay and sellers are willing to accept, an appraiser cannot determine the market price, but can give an opinion of market value. Demand is one of the elements that help determine value. In order for demand to be effective, it must be implemented by Purchasing power Highest and best use Location Amenities The answer is purchasing power. Unless those who want an item can afford to purchase it, their demand will not have any effect on the value of the item. You made it through, congrats. If you're looking to study more, head over to our exam practice question playlist. We have hundreds of questions waiting for you. Good luck, see you soon.